Thank you so much for joining us today, Dan. Thank you, Katie. I really appreciate your interest in my work and inviting me to come on the podcast. Oh, well, hopefully we'll be able to have a, a great conversation today. Can you explain what social ecology is and also what environmental psychology is and how they're different and how they fit together? Well, social ecology grew out of the field of ecology, which started in biology back in the 1800s. And it's basically looking at the interrelationships between organisms and their environments, their living environments, other species, as well as abiotic features of the environment, climate, topography, and that kind of thing. And those biological principles were applied to human communities in the early 1900s. And that field became known as human ecology. But it was almost a literal translation of Darwinian assumptions about how different kinds of organisms adapt to their environments only applied to human communities. So the economic system was seen as the engine of adaptation. And social ecology has provided a broader view based not just on biological principles and economic principles, but also law, ethics, sociological views, how people react to their physical environments, architecture. So it's a, really a transdisciplinary view of how people interact with their everyday large scale and smaller scale environments. Uh, now, environmental psychology is a part of that. It looks more at uh, individuals and small groups, how they perceive the environment, how they learn to behave in certain ways toward the environment, how they're influenced by communication and persuasive efforts to get them to change their behavior, how they're affected by exposure to nature, natural environment. So it's very much at the kind of personal and, and small group level. Social ecology extends from that individual level all the way up to the global sphere. So how is global climate change affecting the quality of our natural environment? How's it affecting public health? Those kinds of issues. I looked it up on Wikipedia and one of the definitions on Wikipedia said social ecology, social component comes from its position that nearly all of the world's ecological problems stem from social problems and that it's easy i think when we're working in sustainability to think it's all just about glaciers or about trees mm -hmm. but your field that you, you study is really looking at the, the human component and i wanted to ask you in terms of the people who are working in cities they're working in not-for-profits they're maybe social change startups what are the type of problems that people are running into by not thinking of things as social problems by not being aware of the lens of psychology to look at the problems they work on well i think sometimes we look at problems that are happening in the global sphere like the loss of the earth's ozone layer or global climate change and planetary warming. Individuals often feel that's so beyond the pale of what they could possibly influence. These things are happening because of atmospheric chemical reactions and physical reactions in the stratosphere and all of that. But these physical problems are largely behavioral and social problems. That is, they stem from the aggregate of a lot of individuals behaving certain ways. So deciding to drive their own cars to and from work each day or eat a lot of meat and rather than changing that dietary practice, whether they buy a Hummer or a Prius in terms of their everyday transportation, all these things have a tremendous impact on carbon emissions, on global climate change. When you aggregate the behaviors of many, many individuals, there's that behavioral component. How do we change people's behaviors in terms of their everyday lifestyle? in ways that are going to affect the quality of our environments. There are social aspects of these problems too, in terms of whether there are normative pressures for people to behave a certain way. A lot of cities that have curbside recycling programs capitalize on the fact that people see their neighbors doing it, so they feel some pressure to do that as well. And so there are a variety of different kinds of social processes that come into play in terms of how people behave toward their environments, whether they're willing to adopt certain regulations that are going to put some constraints on their use of certain resources. That's a big debate today in terms of whether we should be a, a regulated or regulatory society or a less regulated one. So there are these behavioral and social components to our massive physical global planetary problems. And unless we see those connections, we're going to have a harder time changing the behaviors that en masse create them those problems or contribute to them. It seems that the, the field of so, social ecology plays an important part in bringing all these different disciplines together. In my experience of working in sustainability, people do tend to get siloed, I feel, mm -hmm. into their industry or their profession. I mean, I studied environmental engineering and the engineers go and work on engineering problems. I lived in Silicon Valley. They see the world through the lens of computer problems. In not-for-profits, they're trying to lobby the government and fundraise. And people who work in government are completely focused on 
and designing new ordinances and laws. And that's what's attracted yeah. me so much to the field of psychology because I feel it's this missing link to bring so many different fields together and how important it is for people to start learning about the different fields and understanding the interconnections in the whole system. Yes. I, one of the things I've tried to do in the book on social ecology in the digital age is to really connect those different disciplinary views and scales of looking at a problem. Many folks approach sustainability at a very global level, like how are we going to enact the kinds of international multilateral treaties like Paris Climate Accord or the Montreal Protocol to ban ozone depleting substances? How can we promote sustainability through those global international efforts? And those are very important. But in order for those to have traction and to be operationalized, they need to be connected to efforts at other levels. You have the homeowner deciding to install residential solar energy, or you have a state regulation like we now have in California that all future housing development must include residential solar energy systems, which is a, it's a massive <laughs> regulation and impact. So all of these levels fit together. The educational level is really important as well, teaching people to understand ecological relationships. We have uh, something called Energy Star ratings for different products we use, like computers, and that tells us which computers are more efficient in how they use energy. But of course, that only relates to when the computer's turned on using energy. And when you look at the life cycle of that computer, the resources that were extracted from the earth, perhaps in some other country to build that computer, the transportation costs of getting it to market, the e-waste that gets created when the computer is disposed of, the health problems that sometimes come from all of that e-waste, that's expanding the temporal view of things, the, the life cycle analysis, where you start to see there are many impacts of this product on the world around us, and the energy efficiency is just one slice of the puzzle. And so teaching people how to look ecologically at the products they use every day, where they come from, this is a point that Goldman makes in his, his book on ecological intelligence, but it's training and encouraging sustainability values in children, teaching them the kinds of values that will sustain sustain their green lifestyles later on. If people don't begin to develop those values, they're not going to be persuaded by a quick information campaign. Uh, there has to be that broad understanding. So it's, it's really important to connect the individually oriented education, the behavior change strategies, the what happens in our behavior settings, our, our homes, our workplaces, our schools, on up to municipalities and neighborhoods, the, the, the state level, the national level. Mm. And what I hear you saying is to, for us not to get to tunnel vision in one particular strategy. I think it's so easy yes. to become tunnel visioned and think this is the answer. There are many answers that all fit together like a big puzzle piece with lots of these different layers from very granular individual yeah. right up to global. And the social ecology helps us look at things in this big sort of three-dimensional puzzle system of the world. And um, the environmental psychology perspective becomes really crucial to all of that because it drills down on issues like why do people not pay attention to certain messages or why do they not perceive the links between their actions and what's happening to the environment? The psychological perspective begins to reveal certain issues that are, are often invisible to us in terms of how we're affecting the environment. You know, most ecological theory look at people's relationship with their natural environment, their built environment, kinds of things people build from their homes or workplaces, their roads, their products, the sociocultural environment. But what I've added in the book is an emphasis on a fourth sphere of environmental influ influence, which I'm calling the cybersphere. And that's very large. It includes the internet, our shared economy, artificial intelligence, cryptocurrencies. There are a lot of cyber technologies. We use these technologies without much sense often as to how they're affecting the environment or what implications they have. So one of the things I look at in this book on social ecology is some of the invisible impacts that these cyber technologies are having on energy use. Uh, for example, Bitcoin now accounts for 0.5% of the world's energy use, and it's going to keep growing and growing. The Internet of Things currently involves billions of different products, equipment, talking to each other. Each of them has a sensor, an IP address, and they're streaming information to each other continuously without a lot of human intervention. This is going to grow to a trillion linked devices. Well, that's an enormous amount of energy that's being used. The, the, the one estimate is that by the year 2030, the cybersphere will account for more than 50% of the world's energy use and for about 25% of the Earth's greenhouse 
gas emissions. So that's a big impact. And it's not to say the internet is bad, but by becoming alert to these issues that aren't always visible, we start to think about, well, how can we design computer trips that are going to have a smaller ecological footprint? Because obviously these cyber technologies, are, we're, we're getting increasingly dependent on, and that's why I, I view it as a fourth sphere or domain of environmental influence that has to be taken account of. So, you know, trying to get people a little bit more aware of those things. And also, I think psychology and behavioral strategies have a lot to contribute in terms of how to change behavior. So there, there are ways in, of using strategies of social praise, social feedback, reinforcement that go way beyond information campaigns to get people to be aware of and to change their behaviors in a more sustainable direction. It's so fascinating. I think that in order to get into the motivational heart of the human being, there's a lot of different ways. And I think it's easy to think that there's only one way, like, oh, giving a financial incentive is the only way to motivate people, which is usually what I hear people say is, oh, we just need to make it really expensive. Uh, but there's actually a multitude of ways that you can tap in to get people motivated. Let's say there's a bunch of different things that you can yeah. look at, like social comparison, norms, which you mentioned, some financial incentives. One thing that I see missing is governments, corporations, not-for-profits, people trying to do sustainability work, is that people are missing out on applying the scientific method to these mm -hmm. things. You're an academic, so you would really, I think, understand the, the process. People who publish academic reports understand the concept of a hypothesis and evidence and backing yes. that up. It's yes. what you do. Say if you're working for a waste company and you develop a flyer or a sign or you're at not-for-profit and you're designing a billboard campaign or redoing your website to try and get people to do all these different things. How can people start to apply this scientific method and this hypothesis evidence system in, in the real world? Well, there are many very interesting and powerful examples of taking that scientific method and applying it in the field to sustainability issues. So there's a, a very interesting study that was done by Mike Goldstein, Bob Cialdini at Arizona State University, where they went to a hotel in Phoenix and they wanted to change hotel guests' behavior in terms of whether or not they recycle their towels every night and get fresh new ones each day. And of course, the more of that that happens, the more washing machine use, the more energy that's consumed in that process. So if you can cut down the rate of getting new towels every night and get people to reuse the same towels during their stay, that, that cuts down on energy use. So what the researchers did is they developed these towel hanger messages. You know, when you come into the hotel, you go, into the bathroom, there's a little hanging message on the towels, please reuse your towels. They changed the message appeals on each of these hangers. So one of them said, please reuse the towels. It's better for the environment. We use less energy that way. Another one said, if you reuse your towels and you help us save energy, then this hotel will donate to a pro-environmental fund. So it's kind of a reciprocity appeal. The third approach was simply telling the hotel guests that 75% of the guests who stayed in the same room previously reused their towels. So the that was a socially descriptive norm. What they found was that was the most powerful appeal, just telling people what others like them did. That kind of, as you were saying, that social comparison motive that people have. So that was a very interesting field experimental approach to simply changing the message that's printed on the towel hanger, then measuring the behavior of the hotel guests to see how many turned in their towels each night, how many reused their towels. There have been other kinds of strategies to evaluate whether giving people reinforcement gets them to conserve or recycle more regularly. There's a lot of very good review articles about the power of social feedback in getting people to conserve resources in their household and also in other kinds of settings like workplaces. What's social yeah. feedback? What, what does that mean? And there's also something called behavioral feedback. If you have an electronic system hooked up to your computer in your home that tells you how much energy your different appliances are using each day and you start to monitor that energy use just for your home, evidence suggests that that once you have that reference point and you can see what you're using, you're much more efficient at bringing the use down, assuming that there's some kind of injunctive uh, norm or motivation to reduce energy or conserve resources. Just giving people the behavioral feedback is very powerful in changing their behavior. The social feedback is more in the realm of what do your neighbors think or what your good friends think? What do they do when you get your energy utility bill 
is there a smiley face for reducing your energy use that month? Or do you get a frowning face saying, boy, you were an energy hog this month and you really need to do better next time around? That's social feedback. The behavioral and the social feedback turn out to be as influential as paying people to act sustainably. And paying people are things like giving people rebates on their solar energy systems. So certainly giving business managers rebates on equipment in their companies that are energy star rated for efficiency, that's a kind of financial incentive. But the these other strategies through experimental studies have been established as being just as effective as social and the behavioral feedback and the praise. Getting back to your initial question, it, it shows how the social component of these broad environmental problems is really critical to consider. There are experimental studies of how to frame messages about climate change. If you frame that message in terms of the health implications of climate change to people, the fact that climate change has very direct impacts on their physical health, people seem to be more responsive to those kind of persuasions of messages than if you were to frame the message in terms of national security. If we all save energy, our nation will be stronger for that. That's a more abstract concept. But what happens to your own health makes a big difference, and people are more likely to pay attention to that message and comply with it. One of the reasons we've had a lot of success in dealing with the ozone loss issue, which comes about through certain kind of artificial chemicals that are produced by people on Earth, they waft up into the stratosphere and through chemical reactions when they're hit by ultraviolet light, they start combining with ozone molecules and eating them up, basically destroying them. But one of the reasons that the Montreal Protocol has been so effective is that people realize that if we don't block all this ultraviolet B radiation that's hitting the earth, more of that ultraviolet light gets through and it causes more skin cancer, it causes more eye cataracts. And so people could relate to those very specific health threats. It's fascinating to hear of all the different ways that you can create change. And the towel example, that's a really simple kind of study, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're just putting out three different types of what is right. it, little hanger, little hook. It doesn't require any technology. But I think what it does require, though, is understanding yes. what norms are that people like to copy other people and the principle of reciprocity and then comparing against the principle of a message. So I think what people need to do is do your course on iTunes, read your book and learn the theory underpinning so they can start testing out these different messages and if bringing it back to the, the climate change yes. message and the ozone message that you were talking about is seeing if the financial model that you want to implement works is trying a appeal to nature try and appeal to people's health try an, a normative approach line up all of the different approaches that yes. you think can possibly work and test them rather than just jump to conclusions i yes. think that what happens is people just jump to a conclusion that they need to do one thing and then they'll be like oh we tried that and it didn't work i mean people say all sorts of all sorts of we, things about why whatever they tried didn't work you're very right about the theoretical grounding of that study one of the authors bob sheldini he is one of the world's foremost experts on social persuasion he and his colleagues were very well situated to understand these different theoretical approaches from giving somebody a socially descriptive norm or giving them an injunctive norm. You should do this because it's good for the environment. And if you don't do it, you're a bad person. Or the reciprocity norm. If you reuse your towels, then the hotel will save enough money and will contribute something down the road. So that's a reciprocity appeal. They had to be aware of these different theoretical approaches in order to create a clever, elegantly designed field experimental study. It didn't require a lot of technology. It, it just required a very targeted use and comparison of these different persuasive messages. There are ways of evaluating regulatory strategies to see if they work or not. For example, in Southern California, when I came to Irvine in 1973, most days of the year, I was, I was seeing this smog, except maybe during some of the winter months where you could see the mountains in the distance with the snow on them. But what happened in Southern California through the creation of the South Coast Air Quality Monitoring District is that they put into effect a number of regulatory approaches like automobiles had to have smog checks and the composition of gasoline had to change so that there was less lead, it was more efficient in the burning. So these regulations, when they were evaluated in terms of what were the levels of respiratory illness and hospitalizations before those went into effect, what were the levels later on? And looking across some comparison communities where the regulations didn't happen, there's a lot of evidence suggesting that they were quite effective in terms of improving public health and also the air quality. It's not to say that we've solved 
the air pollution problem. So we have a long ways to go, but I'm saying that different disciplines from the regulatory to the behavior change have something to contribute and need to be integrated so we have more powerful approaches rather than just relying on one angle. Yeah, one thing I've found interesting in talking to a lot of people about their environmental data and how they might visualize, and as well as talking to people about uh, behavioral psychology is how important it is to actually use it to influence government. That it's not just technology is over here and behavioral psychology is over here and government's over here. It's very important for an environmental not-for-profit working on air pollution that they can have better data and they can use the principles in order to influence governments. I'm just elaborating that I'm agreeing with you about how important it is for all the different fields to be interconnected. You know, one of the boldest, most ambitious efforts to apply science to global climate change has been through the reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, where multiple governments around the world had their scientists team up in panels that, that study gathered huge amounts of data. But since the, the age of the Anthropocene, where people are actually starting to change the Earth system, and some people say that started around the Industrial Revolution, late 1700s, but some of the most compelling evidence is it started around 19. 19- right after World War II, where the economies around the world boomed, poverty was being alleviated at great rates, Uh, education to masses of people were increasing. So there were many benefits of the post-World War II acceleration. They call it the Great Acceleration. But the aftermath of all that acceleration is that we now have these lagged impacts on the Earth's system, you know, the, the planetary warming, the depletion of ozone. So these studies have been tremendously informative in showing those relationships and showing exactly what's happening on the Earth. The problem is that there's also a political ecology and a set of ideologies as to whether people want to pay attention to that data. In, in many countries, there's questioning about the value of science. So if you don't pay attention to this information that's been gathered, and it's very reliable, if we screen that out and we start to decide that it's not useful, uh, or we scrub it from websites of our agencies so that people don't know about that data, then that's a real problem in my view. Part of the issue is not just applying the science and gathering the data, but as you said, how do we use it and pay attention to it and make it digestible so that people act on it. Yeah, I am entirely fascinated by the feedback loop around environmental data. You talk about in your book about being this digital sphere in social ecology. Where I see the digital sphere as being really exciting is that we can cover the world with sensors and that's opening up all of this data that was never there before. I mean, 100 years ago, we didn't know how much CO2 there was in the air. Air pollution sensors didn't exist to tell us the information. And a lot of the sensors do exist, but they haven't really been deployed, I think, anywhere near they could be. And you mentioned earlier earlier about behavioral feedback. Uh So we can use this data to create behavioral feedback. What do you see happening in this next phase or what can we do to help encourage this new digital sphere with the sensors and the data and these feedback loops? Where do you see that going? I think it's a very exciting stage that we're in historically to be able to gather and make sense out of that data, use artificial intelligence to make assessments of health conditions, to improve our economic growth so that it's more sustainable. I'm a big proponent of using that data. In the book, when I look at some of the issues that we have to be sensitive to about the cybersphere, one is the enormous power that these cyber technologies require, the energy, the electricity, the greenhouse gas emissions. So we have to manage these technologies technologies and make them as efficient as possible to reduce their negative impact on the environment. The other concern is that these cyber technologies are very linked to our social functioning, our governance institutions. And when you have the capability of managing information or changing information on the internet, and you can play around with people's beliefs about the validity of information, that's potentially problematic. For example, if people start to feel that their use of an electronic voting machine is is somehow going to be hacked or if people lose their belief in the validity of science because some folks on the internet are telling them that the scientific information isn't believable or it's... So I think the authenticity of our information ecology, that's something we have to pay attention to as well. So those are two aspects of these data systems that I think we have to think about. The energy expenditure, the social impacts of misuses, hacks or cyber attacks on some of these systems. And there's one third 
third kind of issue that has to do with people's perceptual and cognitive capabilities, and that is being able to use the data in ways that don't overwhelm us. We do get exposed to a lot of information coming at us through digital communications and the like, and so there's a little more pressure on people now to manage a lot of information and sift through it and not be overwhelmed by it. So those are just some things we ought to think about. They're cautionary. They're not saying that the internet is bad, data systems are bad, but just to be aware that this cybersphere that's become a huge influence on us since the 1980s, we just have to be aware of the enormity of its impacts and, and manage it in ways that make our use of it more sustainable, more beneficial to public health and the like. You mentioned earlier that when you provide people feedback of the data, like you can tell someone how much energy they're using in real time, but that really immediately affects their behavior. So that's what's exciting to me, that one particular angle of making the environmental footprint that was once invisible, visible to people. Yes. And also health behaviors. I mean, the whole personal fitness movement where you have sensors that you're wearing telling you what's happening with your blood pressure, what's happening with your the number of steps you've taken that day in terms of your energy expenditure, how much sleep you're getting. All of those things are certainly related to health and they're giving people instantaneous feedback on behaviors or physiological processes that affect their health outcomes. That whole movement is based on the power of that feedback. Yeah, the first podcast episode I did is called Fitbit for the Planet. It's about air quality quality sensors and the, uh-huh. the woman who I interviewed said we're trying to be Fitbit for the planet. So it's a great example to sort of correlate the this big or potential nascent environmental sensor movement, I think, with. There was another example I wanted to ask you about. I watched your course several years ago. One thing I remembered was the bird head bin. <laughs> but yes. Can you explain what that means and why it works and what we can learn from it? Yes, this really interesting study was done by some colleagues at Virginia Tech, Scott Geller, Dick Winnett. They were interested in what kind of designs of trash receptacles would influence people's tendency to pick up trash and put it in the trash bin. And they had this idea that if we could make trash bins more salient to people by decorating them to look like birds, and it had an anti-litter prompt printed on the side, please be responsible and pick up your litter. So you had a social exhortation to pick up the litter and deposit it. You had a decoration of the receptacle to make it more visible so people would see it. And then they went into shopping malls in Blacksburg, Virginia, and they compared how much trash was actually put into your standard trash can and the decorated can. They found that significantly more pounds of trash were deposited into the decorated trash cans. So again, it was a nice experimental study comparing these two different designs. And it shows the power of the psychological and the behavioral perspective in changing people's actions toward the environment. And there are other strategies that are being used to help people recycle and deposit waste more effectively. So now many public facilities have multiple trash bins where you have the recycling bin or you have the the landfill bin or the trash that can't be recycled. So trying to get people to be more discriminatory or differentiating in their behavior toward waste and giving them options to encourage people to recycle, to encourage people to deposit their waste and making them very visible. If the bird head bin was so successful, why don't we see bird, whale, frog bins everywhere? Why have I never seen one? As I said, there's some diffusion of this research information into the waste receptacle and recycling fields because you're seeing some of those aspects pop up in public facilities where you get the messaging printed on the bin, you get the sorting aspect where people are asked to discriminate where they put what kinds of trash. There probably could be a lot more of those American Eagle or Frog or Whale trash cans. Yeah, I really like the example because I'm really into using creativity to change uh-huh. the world. I think it's something that's not used that much. The same way that you mentioned that we think of environmental problems as just trees and molecules, they're not human behaviors. I think we also right. don't tend to think that everything that we do to make the world better is a creative solution. I really liked the eagle bin because I just thought it was so creative. I just thought, yeah, that's what an artist would come up with. And I think the more that we can start to think like that, start to think out of the box and then test yeah. out these solutions using the scientific method, just the the better we'll be at all this stuff. The towel hanger study that I mentioned out of Arizona State. This study by Geller uh, was also based on a careful consideration of psychological theories. So he's an expert on behavioral reinforcement theory, cognitive mental mapping. How do you make the environment 
bit more visible and stand out to people. So he was really using these different strategies, social praise, or, or at least the anti-litter prompt as a kind of persuasive tool, along with the creative design of the trash can. So it came out of that theoretical grounding. And sometimes these very elegant or simple studies, uh, you think, boy, that was, that was a cool idea. Where did that come from? And a lot of it comes out of these different theories of behavior change. That's why I've done the podcast, to try and help extract some of yeah. this knowledge. I mean, just for myself, so I understand it better, but also so my community of people actually working on these things can help understand so they can come up with better ideas. Yeah, well, um, I, I appreciate your effort to get the message out to a broader audience, which is one of the reasons I was excited to come on your podcast, because yeah. <laughs> it's important to diffuse the, the findings and get people aware of them, right? People who are in positions to use them, environmental managers, company managers, you know, practitioners who might yeah, not know about the research. I truly, deeply believe that everybody who works on trying to make the world better can get dramatically better at it by just having the light bulb switch on about a few of these things. But it's yeah. a shame that it hasn't gotten out more. I ask a lot of people, have you ever heard of the field of environmental psychology? Do you know what a norm is? You know, the value action gap. Definitely no one has ever heard of environmental psychology. Some people have heard of the value action gap. No one really understands what a norm is. I can't say I've surveyed that many people, but it's been, I don't know, maybe 50 or so people I've asked and professional people working in a job of influencing change. As someone trained in engineering, you're kind of modeling that cross-disciplinary thinking and reaching out, you know, trying to get a broader view of things beyond your primary training. And I think that's what's so important to encourage students to do that, to get trained in a particular discipline or two, but then be open to these other perspectives so they can begin to integrate the ideas and get a perhaps a more powerful approach to practical problems and if they just come at it from one angle. Yeah, and I think all of the innovation happens at the nexus, like when people, you bring in game design with data and creativity and storytelling with science, and it's when you bring these things together that you get some real magic happen. And we haven't yet talked about the urban landscape, which you study mm. a lot, and about how we can bring more nature into the urban landscape. Why is it important to have more green space in the city? Well, you know, we're reading more and more reports these days, even in the press, about the power of nature. And these kind of claims are actually based in a lot of research and science. We're seeing that experimental studies that look at things like people's exposure to everyday nature in their homes or around their homes behave differently. They report different moods. They, they report better moods. Let me give you an example. There was a really interesting study done by Francis Quo at the University of Illinois on the residents of low-income housing projects in Chicago. And these are not affluent residents, but some of the windows faced out to a tree. So they had a view of a tree and grass. Other apartments faced asphalt or the side of another building. And when she measured people's mood in these different apartment groups, and she even measured levels of domestic abuse reported and aggressive behavior, she found that among the people that had the nature views, the mood was improved and better, but the levels of aggression and domestic abuse measures were lower, which was very interesting because you'd think, well, this is just a, an ambient feature of the environment, whether you can look out your window at a tree or not. It was having some major psychological and behavioral impacts. Another study, which was done a while back by Roger Ulrich in a hospital setting where he compared gallbladder surgery patients from the day they got out of surgery until they checked out of the hospital. And he went back through their records and he found very co similar comparison groups of patients whose windows faced nature outside their hospital windows, trees and grass, others that faced the side of a building. And he found some striking results over the days after surgery, where the people who were in the nature rooms requested less or weaker pain medication. They checked out of the hospital sooner than the people who were in the non-nature rooms. They had less reports in their records by hospital personnel about their acting out or their being rude and that kind of thing. Their social behavior seemed a little more mellow as well if they had that nature view. And again, you'd think you're in the hospital, you're thinking about whatever ails you and you're not particularly worried about what you see out your window. But he found these very compelling results and those were republished in Science Magazine, not so much because it was the end-all be-all conclusive study on effects of nature on people's health, but because it was so 
provocative and so compelling and opened up a whole line of research on the effects of exposure to nature on, on people's well-being. So there have been many, many studies since then that kind of confirm those findings. Uh, when you bring urbanites into, and, and this has been done experimentally, where they go on a nature walk through a park or they go to the city center where there's hardly any nature and you compare their moods and you compare physiological measures of stress and you find these differences, particularly on the psychological measures in those studies of the benefits of going out on that nature walk or getting away from the urban um, core and getting into more of a park area. There are even studies done in England where through GIS measures of how much nature is adjacent to somebody's home. They have this for millions of residents in England. They put these huge databases together and they compare different groups for income. So you have very high income groups compared to very low income groups. And then you cross cut that with high or low levels of exposure to nature around their homes. We know there are health disparities between groups that are more affluent and those that are low income. The low income groups suffer many, many more health problems, psychologically and physical. But those differences, those health disparities were dampened, particularly in the groups that had the high exposure to nature. So that's where the benefit, especially to the low-income people, was greatest. It sort of buffered their stress, they, or at least their health outcomes. They had better health outcomes, or there wasn't as much a discrepancy between the affluent and the non-affluent in the nature condition. In the low nature condition, those results were very you know, extreme. So you had the vulnerable groups much more susceptible to the negative effects of not having nature near them. And it's typically the case that low-income neighborhoods don't have as much nature. So in that sample, because they had so many data points, they had millions of data points, they could select and find a group of low-income residents that actually had a fair amount of nature near their home so they could make that comparison. There's research suggesting that ocean shorelines and seascapes are particularly restorative to people. They help people kind of recover their attentional energy. William James, a famous psychologist in the late 1800s, posited this difference between voluntary attention and involuntary attention. So voluntary attention is where you rivet your attention on some task. You know, you're studying for an exam, you don't want to be distracted, you're screening out distractions, and you engage in that kind of behavior long enough, you start to get mentally fatigued. You, your attention gets fragmented, you get tired mentally. What James suggested is if you can give people opportunities to engage in spontaneous attention, put them in an environment where their attention is drawn to whatever is interesting to them. And the more you have that opportunity for spontaneous attention, the more you can recharge your batteries and resume more of a, a focused attention. So what nature does, according to Stephen Rachel Kaplan, they've developed this theory, they call it attention restoration theory of nature. When you put people in natural settings, it gives them a lot of these opportunities to be fascinated by the waves of the oceans or the sound of birds when you go on a nature hike. It allows you to get away from your usual routines. If you're living in the city core or if you're engaging in very mentally taxing work throughout the week, it gives you a break from that. So that's one of the ways in which nature seems to work in terms of restoring our attentional faculties. But there are also several studies suggesting that it has direct physiological benefits. It calms us down. It, it's associated with better physical health outcomes as well as psychological. Gardening programs in low-income areas in some American cities have been found to be very effective in promoting social capital, connections between people that live in that apartment complex because they all come out and they take care of the garden and they meet each other and they socialize. Even gang violence in some of those neighborhoods goes down because the gang members get recruited <laughs> To, they start to, growing vegetables instead of... Yeah, protecting vegetables <laughs> and taking, taking care of the gardens. So there's a whole movement called Landscape urbanism now, which is really emphasizing that benefit to people. Yeah, I remember one of the slides in one of your lectures had violent crime going up with heat. And the last podcast I just released was about urban heat islands. And it's the same thing. You get an urban heat island because you don't have yes. enough trees. Yes. So the, the, it seems that the tree, <laughs> and I've actually been working quite a lot on a side project on urban heat islands. It just <laughs> seems that once the more trees and more green space just help everything. They help energy, air pollution, water runoff, crime, domestic violence. It seems like the tree is the answer to <laughs> or kind of all of the urban problems. It's not a magic bullet, but it sure does have a lot of proven benefits. I mean, from many different studies, that's becoming more and more evident. The whole green roof movement where in cities people create gardens and, and even vegetable patches on their roofs has the benefit of insulating those buildings more effectively so they don't lose as much energy. As you say, for the city 
as a whole, it cuts down on the heat island effect and it prevents more waste and runoff of water when it rains. One of the things that the sustainability field is moving toward is a closer connection between people's local infrastructures and resources like residential solar energy systems that can go off grid, home water capture systems where you can capture rainwater, urban farming where you can do localized gardening to produce those resources. So all of those take the pressure off these more centralized regional infrastructures, you know, industrial agriculture and transport food across great distances to get it to market. And the fact that a lot of that food gets wasted as it sits on the shelves and it's not used or it gets used up in transit. If a water distribution sector goes down because of some natural event like an earthquake or a flood issue, or if you know the electrical grid of a city is attacked through some kind of cyber attack, the more people can be independent and resilient in terms of using their local resources that take some of the pressure off the, the larger infrastructures. I wanted to explore the concept of systems theory, how whether you're looking at the system versus the individual and some of the information you've put together about the architecture of obesity. Because uh, I thought that was a really interesting example about looking at the system versus the individual. And I think people that maybe haven't thought too much along that line, well, it happens all the time. People think people are suffering from obesity because they're lazy. We've got problems in the world because people are greedy. Our children are having problems because mothers are bad. Women are single parents because the, it's the woman's fault. Problems go wrong in the military because there's a few bad apples. There's an entire massive conversation always going on about blaming the individual rather than yeah. blaming the system. And people, I think, can probably be a bit biased either yeah. way. But one of the, you've got a whole example about how we actually design cities to make people obese. Everywhere is a system with the roads and the the way that we design the food system, the way people would just buy food, not the whole supply chain of it. What do we need to avoid doing in our design of cities to make people sick? And what do we need to do to make cities make people healthy? Yeah, no, I, I think in the, the health promotion field, the urban planning field, there is this distinction between what individuals should do and what you can do at the system level. And we know that cities that have a lot of sprawl, where people are commuting large distances between homes and the workplace, a lot of the cities with a lot high air pollution levels, those are also associated with very high rates of obesity because people are more sedentary. They're, they're commuting more hours of the day. They're sitting at home. They don't want to go outside because of the pollution. Obviously, many of these problems have to be approached at the system level through regulations that bring down the pollution or by uh, designing new neighborhoods or retrofitting existing neighborhoods where there are more job opportunities close to where people live. So that's a kind of systems view. But often you can get a lot more leverage by approaching the problem at a systems level. I mean, one thing an urban planner would want to do is build in a lot of opportunity for physical activity. So public parks not only expose people to trees, but they give them a chance to get out of the house or the apartment and walk around. So green belts near where people live gives them these opportunities for physical activity, which they might not have and otherwise be more susceptible to obesity and diabetes and that kind of thing. It's very important to look at a system and try to gain leverage that way. Even if I'm looking at a company, let's say we're talking about a corporate environment, and I want the individuals to turn off their lights when they go out of their office so they can serve energy, or I want them to eat healthier so that they don't come in with as many sick days. I can give them information appeals and tell them why they should do all these things as individuals, and that's called an active intervention where you're trying to get them to actively change their behavior. There's a whole set of interventions called passive interventions, where in terms of the energy conservation, I as a manager decide I'm going to outfit all the offices in that company with light sensors. So when they go out of the office after 30 seconds, the lights go off. I can also change the meals that are provided in the corporate meal room. And rather than give people options of unhealthy food, I can make everything on the menu heart healthy. So when they go down there and get their food, they don't have a choice. Like they're all healthy choices. Those are system interventions where you're trying to do things at a broader level to affect a lot of individuals in that system, which turns out often to be much more effective than trying to change each of those individuals' behavior. In the health promotion field or the energy conservation field, I sometimes refer to this as personal health behaviors or personal energy sustainability behaviors and other directed. And what I mean by other directed is often a, a manager in a company or an elected official, they're making decisions that affect 
thousands, hundreds, maybe in some cases millions of people through their actions. And you can get a lot of leverage by changing the behavior of those mediators, the people that make decisions on behalf of others, like whether I'm going to put ergonomic chairs in all of the workstations at the office that I manage so that people have less back problems. That's a, a system-wide decision. I have to decide, do I put the resource into buying those ergonomic chairs? But in the long run, what's going to be the return on investment so that people are coming in with fewer sick days or worker compensation days and things like that. And as you're pointing out, that the system perspective gives you a lot of leverage sometimes in changing the behavior of people who make decisions about other people's health or th their energy conservation behavior so that you don't have to go to each one of them and try to change the behavior individually. Yeah, and I'd also really like to encourage people that perhaps don't see themselves as that much of an influencer, but they're looking at their own personal environmental impact. I follow the zero waste movement. You know, the people uh -huh. that live, they only make enough waste to fit into a jar. Also, the vegan movement, the low meat yeah. diet. So I kind of get involved with those communities and those communities are largely focused on every person taking individual action. Their posts and their consciousness is about, oh, how do I make less waste? How do I use less meat? Mm -hmm. How do I deal with this? And I always try and encourage those people to actually start to think about the system that they're in a little bit more. I said, you probably work at a school or at a company or you live in an apartment block there. We're all in systems somehow that we can influence. I think people want to do a lot more to contribute and to look at those institutions that they're a part of in their life and how they might be able to change something systemic to influence how their whole apartment block works or how yes. their whole company works. But I also wanted to ask you about the health benefits of being close to people, about being around lots of people versus being away from people. I have a, a personal question to ask you. We live in San Francisco, my friends and I, and everybody's stressed out about living in the city but we love being around all the people and the culture in the city. But we also desperately want to move out to Marin or to Santa Cruz to get away from the city. Now, there's a lot of research around showing how important it is to be around people for health. Yeah. But then you want to be around nature too, and then the city is stressful too. Can you explain a bit more about that? And what should all of us do who can't make this decision about where to live? <laughs> well, I think one of the things you can do is be in touch with what's important to you. I think people are going to prioritize those issues a little differently. Some people are very social and want to be with people much of the time, and they're willing to trade off, you know, living in some suburban, cleaner, maybe safer area for being in the center city where they have maximum access to cultural and recreational opportunities. So people weigh those things differently. But I think it's important for people to be aware of all of those trade-offs. What's their mental calculus for what's important to them? Because some people will put up with a very long commute to work just to live in a place that has more nature or it has a better school system for the kids. People weigh those things differently. You're right that there's a lot of influence suggesting that social support is very beneficial to health. Before people get sick, in terms of sort of protecting them by their being engaged in a social system that seems to have protective value, but also if they get ill, you know, being able to rely on and get the support of others, either emotionally or tangibly, where people come over and bring them food or give them that support. So unless you're somebody that really is very individualistic, isolationist, don't need to be around people that much, that turns out to be a really important consideration for most people. Yeah, and it seems that there are these three really substantial issues facing urban design, which one is we need to be around a lot of people and be close to them. That's essential for our health and well-being. Yeah. Then the second one is the urban stress, which I definitely personally feel a great deal. I get very stressed by our noises and pollution yeah. and, a, and a lack yeah. of nature. I really feel it. And then the third one is the amount of nature, the trees and the green spaces. So you've got these three principles that really, that we need to design this new era of cities that are going to be enormous and only getting bigger and bigger to have lots of people not so expensive that they push everybody out where people can become friends not get totally strung out by all of the pollution and the, just the stress of living in the city and also have plenty of green space i suppose that's the big challenge for us is to figure out how to make that work for everybody well for people that live in the inner city there's certainly more and more of a movement to to bring nature into 
people's apartments, the dwelling space, the roofs of the buildings, having adjacent park areas that makes living in the center of the city more habit, uh, more tolerable or, or enjoyable. I think I mentioned to you earlier this really interesting study that my friend and colleague Sheldon Cohen at Carnegie Mellon University did. He was interested in knowing how stress affects people's immunity to infectious diseases like colds. So he actually did a, a field experimental study where he brought people into a quarantined area for about 10 days and paid them some money to be in the study to have a cold virus squirted into their nose. Uh, what a <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, a lot of people signed up, said, yeah, I'll do it. And then he watched what happened, who got sick and how severe were the colds and he measured severity of colds in a lot of different ways. But the other interesting thing he did is he administered a scale he's developed called the perceived stress scale. So in the past four weeks, how much have you been overwhelmed by things in your life? How much have you been going through conflict with others who are important to you? These sort of day-to-day -day stressors that people face. And so he had a, has a measure of getting people to assess that for the past month of their life. And then he divided the people, he was able to divide them into the highly stressed group and those that reported relatively low stress during that period. And what he found is that the individuals who were highly stressed were much more likely to get the cold when they had a rhinovirus put into their nose. They got more severe colds. Uh, some of the people in the low stress group didn't get the cold or they had very mild versions of it. And that study and the findings have been replicated in other research. And it applies not only to infectious diseases, but also susceptibility to chronic disease, stress and chronic inflammation physiologically that comes from stress. Those are common risk factors for a lot of diseases, whether it's heart disease, cancer, diabetes. So the more we can curb that stress and reduce that chronic inflammation, the better we're going to be. Temporary inflammation is very healing. I mean, you get a cut on your skin, you're, it gets red around there, the redness helps the area heal. But if inflammation goes on chronically over long periods of time and you can't turn it off, then it starts to take a toll on your internal systems. So what you were mentioning about stress of living in the city, I think people have to be in touch with, well, how much stress are they really under? How are they feeling about that? Is it more than they can handle? Is it just enough to make things interesting and exciting? And you, you have to kind of make that personal assessment because it's the fit between the individual and the environment or the system that is really determinative in terms of what, what the well-being is going to be. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating. You mentioned that study about the cold virus because I know I only ever get a flu when I get really upset about something. Yeah, I know well, there's a direct correlation. If I get upset about something and I spend a whole night crying and something's really gotten yeah. to me, I don't think I ever get a cold unless I've had an emotionally stressful event happen. Yeah. So yeah, what I, I tell know, people is that I don't believe in germs. They'd be like, oh, I've got a cold. And I'm like, listen, I won't catch it. I'm in a good mood today. You know, but if I'm yes, in a bad mood, I'm like, oh, no, I'll catch it. Well, the whole, uh, you know, the research on the microbiome and, and our composition in terms of human cells versus bacteria, you know, estimates range from whether there are 10 times more bacterial cells in human. I think more recent estimates are that we're about 40% bacterial cells, but we're constantly awash in bacteria. And so you're absolutely right. It's these moments of vulnerability, and that can happen because of psychological stress, it can be hap happen because something we ate or we get exposed to multiple stressors at one time. But those make a big difference in terms of when the bacteria become more dominant and start to make us ill. But there is this ever fascinating and inextricable connection between human health and environmental health. I can't stand it when I see environmental issues just packaged into this thing. They're like, oh, that's green. Not many people are into green as if it's like this little kind of like fringe hobby or something. Mm -hmm. That there's so that the health of the city through, you know, more green spaces and the health of the human, the environment and the human are all the one thing. We can't yes. separate human health and and environmental health at all. My PhD training was in social psychology and it was experimental laboratory social psych. But in college, I got quite interested in a lot of different disciplines and from macro to micro. And so when I was in grad school, I was kind of missing the more macro community societal side of things. So I took minors in city and regional planning, sociology, did research in public health. And I was drawn to this program in social ecology when I was coming out of grad school because it offered that freedom to look at issues from a broad interdisciplinary perspective. And the reason I've kind of embraced social ecology as well as environmental psychology as part of that approach is that, as you were saying, the systems view is really powerful. So by viewing people's health or environmental sustainability at these multiple scales, rather than just staying at the psychological behavioral scale, you get a broader understanding. So the work I've done in environmental psychology is an important part of my work on social ecology, but social ecology is 
inherently a broader view because it's, it's linking up with issues related to our global ecosystem. It's linking up with sustainability science, which gathers a lot of non-psychological behavior data. It's data about the state of our Earth system. And so I've gotten really interested in those kinds of things and, and the whole issue of environmental injustice. You know, why is it that sustainability and pollution problems hit vulnerable groups much harder than people that are better off and more affluent. And, and you, you know, you look around every problem that relates to pollution or sustainability, it's always people like women, children, the elderly, the infirm, or people that live in sensitive regions, like in a desert zone or a flood zone or a fire zone or a coastal region that's susceptible to sea rise or people living on an island in the Pacific. You know, those vulnerable regions and subgroups are the ones that feel the sustainability threats first and most severely. One of my colleagues at UCI does research on water problems in the United States, and she found that from 1982 to 2015, 45 million Americans every year were affected by poor water quality, poor enough to violate the Safe Water Drinking Act. And mostly that happens for people in low-income communities. You know, the, the people hit by that in Flint uh, were largely in African-American uh, neighborhoods where the water pipes were old. They were more susceptible to the kind of uh, lead problems that surfaced in the health studies. But even in places like Detroit, you know, there, there's something like 18,000 households that are facing water shutoffs because they can't afford to pay for the water. And in Flint, some of the residents are saying, we don't want to pay for the water because it's still tainted. We'd rather drink out of plastic bottles. So those people are facing water shutoffs. Where I live in Orange County, California, or where you live in San Francisco, the water infrastructure is pretty good. It's not failing at that same rate. But, you know, you get to rural areas where they have a lot of pipes going out to very dispersed farms and residences, and it's harder to maintain all those miles of pipes and make sure they're all functioning well. So rural areas get hit a lot harder by these breakdowns of the water infrastructure, contamination issues. When we talk about sustainability, pollution, climate change, they're not monolithic. They have a lot of different dimensions, each of those, but they also affect people and subgroups in the population quite differently. You're obviously passionate about a lot of different things. <laughs> If there's one thing that gets you really excited about your field or your research, something that almost keeps you awake at night and that your body sort of tingles at the thought of just one particular angle or way of seeing it or thing, what would that one thing be? I'd have to say over the course of my career, some of the most enjoyment and satisfaction and uh, passion that I've derived from my job is working with students to get them to see the world ecologically as part of a system. Many students come in, you know, sort of prepared to focus on one disciplinary approach. And I think one of the most satisfying things to me is when I can get students to think creatively across scales and across disciplines and start coming up with hypotheses that are novel because they're taking that broader view. I think if we can change how the next generation sees the world and their awareness of these system effects we've been talking about, that's one of the most potent sources of change for the better in terms of our environmental sustainability, our public health. It's that leverage you get by getting people to appreciate the science, to appreciate the broader systems view of our relationships with our surroundings and not to think too narrowly about those. That's, that's kind of what gets me excited. I'm, I'm excited about my research. I, I've done a lot of studies that have been quite interesting to me. One of them was a, a study of the effects of airport noise on children going to school under the flight path of Los Angeles Airport and matching and comparing those students with similar schools for socioeconomic composition and race, but looking at the effects of the noise on the kids. And we found some dramatic effects in terms of their diastolic, systolic blood pressure, their ability to solve or work on complex tasks. So the noise and, and even certain aspects of the school design, like how many windows were in a classroom, made a difference in terms of how susceptible the kids were to the noise impacts. And we also looked at the additive effect of whether their homes were in the noisy zone or their homes were outside the zone. So we found these additive effects of living near the airport as well as going to school under that flight path. Uh, and today, we might have framed that study even more broadly in terms of a kind of environmental justice issue. We might ask not just what's the effect of airport noise on children's blood pressure and health outcomes and cognitive performance at school. We might ask, why is it that so many undesirable land uses are found near low-income communities? Because the, the neighborhoods we were studying near the airport were uh, low-income minority neighborhoods. And so we might look across all of Los Angeles and do a kind of GIS 
plot as to where are treatment plants, where are waste dumps, where are airports, things that people don't necessarily like to live close to. And we might see a very skewed distribution uh, because typically communities that have more wherewithal to resist those land uses uh, don't have to put up with them. So all of that's really, you know, of great interest to me and, and has been exciting for me. And also the opportunity to work with students, because that's really where we have the most leverage in sort of changing the world for the future. You know, if I can change how a student sees the world and what they're motivated to do when they leave UCI, that's to me, very satisfying and exciting. And if, if you could have a, a magic wand, say there was a genie that could give you one problem in the world that could be solved, like you could pick a, a thing that you think, one thing that you think would affect lots of other things, mm -hmm. what problem would you choose? I would try to get people to be kinder. Uh, that may sound odd given what we've been talking about today. But I think that so many of our problems um, come from people being closed off to others, being intolerant of other points of view, not worrying about people's feelings when we say something that's harmful or, or uh, insulting. Um, you know, we've, we've come a long ways in terms of our technological prowess. I mean, the, the fact that humans are affecting the Earth system and we're in the age of the Anthropocene reflects how sophisticated we are with technology. The fact that we have a cybersphere that's so multidimensional and powerful reflects human ingenuity. But where our evolution has lagged far behind is in terms of our social capacities, our ability to cooperate, our ability to take scientific information and act on it in rational ways rather than deciding we don't like it or it's, it's uh, not part of our ideology or what have you. So I think, I think I would try to get people to be more tolerant, kinder, you know, to try to sow more goodwill in their communities, because as you said, social connection, social support is, is important for everything that we do in our lives. So that's what I would like to see more progress on. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting that you, that you mentioned that, because there is a quote that I copied, a quote by Winston Churchill that you've used that says, we shape our buildings and afterwards our buildings shape us. So it sounds like it's not really that tangential to sustainability and urban design mm -hmm. that the it's very much a part of that because the way that we shape our buildings and our and our urban landscapes and how much nature reflects the people that we become once we're in yes. those when we're in a beautiful environment that's yes. built for health and happiness we can let down our guard and we can become those better people yeah. and when we're in a hostile a physically hostile, concrete, polluted environment, we become hostile ourselves. Yeah, but the, the physical and the social go hand in hand. So how we shape our social relationships and how we shape our governance institutions also shapes us. So it's the physical environment. And that's part of the message of social ecology. It's looking at that the interfaces among those different aspects of our surroundings. It's a continuous kind of interdependence. Well, that sounds like a beautiful way to finish <laughs> off conversation. It's always really nice to get to a, a lovely insightful <laughs> ending thank you so much for coming on the show today dan it has been an absolute pleasure to talk with you we've covered so many different things around social ecology and about learning to think instead of getting stuck in silos and in tunnel vision social ecology and, and your work teaching us how to think in this cross-disciplinary approach and look at the world through all of the different interrelated systems it's really interesting and looking at green urbanism and how that affects health and the different behavioral approaches we can use to create a beautiful city and the beautiful world that we would like to live in it's been a real pleasure talking to you and i i so appreciate your interest in the work that i and colleagues in these fields are doing and your effort to to get the work diffused out into the broader public now i would highly recommend people jump on itunes and look up the word environmental psychology how many people did you say had done the course well, we've had i think close to 250,000 subscribers in itunes so jump onto itunes and you can watch the lectures there and you can start to drill down into some more of these concepts and start to apply some of them to what you're doing in your process uh you being the, the viewer or the listener and to what you're doing in your mission to change the world and this is dan's book social ecology in the digital age if you would like a more thorough and academic book to explain the concepts some more if you're watching this on youtube don't forget to subscribe on itunes to the podcast how to save the world and if you're listening you can also watch us on the youtube channel and don't forget to sign up to my website katie Dot 
www.datavisualization.com. There's more free downloads that you can get there on how to use data visualization, design, behavioral psychology, and gamification, applying this so we can get better at changing the world. Thank you for listening. And I hope this lovely interview today with Ben has helped turn your dreams for a better world into real and measurable change.